Hello and welcome to week eight of the Based on Balls podcast here at the Johnny Lee Memorial League. I'm Hen, joined alongside Connor and John Height for today's episode. Me and John Height making our season debuts after our banger of a game. John, I'll start with you. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, Hen. It's great to be back on again. We haven't been on since last season. Just a lot of things going on in my uh, personal and work life, so I've been very busy. So I wanted to hop on at least once throughout this stretch. But yeah, I mean, we had a massive matchup on tap, our second matchup ready of the season. It's fortunate to come out ahead. You got a little bit unlucky at the end, which we'll break down just a little bit. But the league's definitely in a really cool spot this year. There's a lot more parity, I feel like, as well. Um, yeah, excited to break everything down with you guys. And Connor, how are you doing? Very good. Um, well, I was in a matchup that came down to the wire, and I think it was recently decided. So that's been an uplift, and tomorrow is a holiday, so can't go wrong with that. No, yeah, Memorial Day weekend. Getting ready indeed. And let's head over to this week's matchup. Uh, I alluded a little bit at the beginning, but me and John Height faced off against each other the second time we've played each other already in week eight. So a little bit of a a little bit with the scheduling, uh, got our got two early matchups and an absolute banger of a game. John Height taking the victory, eight sixty seven to eight sixteen. One of the highest scoring matchups, at least I've seen since I've been in the league over the past couple of years. Uh, Cody has said also he's never seen a team lose scoring this many points. But Connor, I'm actually going to start with you. What did you see from this game? Well, I think the biggest impact of it is. Happened at the end. Um, Ron Lacuna is now out for the year with a, a torn ACL, but this matchup is always fireworks. I believe this is the fifth matchup between Height and Hen, and they didn't uh, disappoint. Hitting wise, pitching wise, relatively even. Um, we've had some critiques about the pitching depth for both clubs, but John scoring 423 pitching points is absolutely crazy. 70 points in, in a two-start week from Marcus Stroman. Miles Michaelis, the unheralded hero with 24. Um, it's a battle of the heavyweights, and I think after this, uh, Hen drops a little bit, and I'm sure the Beach Dogs will have some soul-searching on what tier they are, and this is just a um, vintage height um, clutch performance. Yeah, and for me, um, so this is the first time I've been on the podcast this year to talk really about my team. Obviously, I've only lost to Tita so far this year, which my team was kind of in an off week. And I think Cody said it on one of the last podcasts. might have been last week. Um, but I really think my team is starting to get back to where it was last year. It's definitely not what it was last year, but it's now kind of getting to that point as all my guys are starting to really get hot again. Guys like Aaron Judge. I mean, Judge had 83 points this week. Um, Mookie Betts, Marcus Simeon, Matt also starting to wake up a little bit. Guys that were hot the entire year last year, which kind of led me to that that run I went on is starting to happen again. And I think the big thing as well, and Connor talked about it, is my pitching starting to get better. Um, I was really happy with the pitching. We talked about Stroman. Uh, Max Freed's been a dog. Corbin Burns. Jose Barrios was a good acquisition that I, I'm glad I had. Uh, Ronald Blanco as well, right off the suspended list, dropped almost 40 points. Um, and I think a big key for me as well is that I'm starting to get some reliever points and really nailing some of these streaming guys I've been adding um, because I've had about four or five pitchers hurt the entire year. I've been adding a, a ton of relievers and kind of holding him guys like Luke Weaver, Ryan Walker. Um, I think his name is Lucas or Ur Ursag of Oakland guys like that. have been really contributing to my bullpen um, in addition to the three closers. So, which I think really helped for this week and on hen side um, really couldn't have done much else. I mean, Acuna obviously got hurt today. But he still, he actually outscored my bats by 15. It was 444, 459 in favor of Hen. Um, he lost the Shota and Monaga start, which hurt a little bit. Um, but he still, I mean, Chris Sale, 88 points. Seth Lugo, 31 points. Zach Wheeler, 32. Hen's team showed up. Um, it was just a classic matchup between me and him. And I'm very fortunate to be 5 0 against my close personal friend Hen so far in this league. No, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a bit unfortunate. You, I can't, you know, obviously would have loved to finally get the win over John Height. And, I mean, look, the team did, you know, as best as best as what I could imagine. Uh, you know, I remember in the beginning uh, last week that you were talking uh, people, I think it was Connor and Paul were talking about this could be a set, 
this could this matchup could go in the 800s and it's unfortunate one of us had to lose uh, i mean it's unfortunate i had to lose you know would have beaten any other team most teams pretty soundedly uh you know only a couple other teams even hit the 700 point mark um yeah, I mean, a couple. Of, it really came down to a couple of things, so like you said. No Shota in Managa start that was brutal. Uh, Yusei Kikuchi got lit up today by the Detroit Tigers. I think he had negative nine. Nick Pavetta didn't have a good start. Um, even though Clay Holmes had a like still finished with positive points, he started the week with a negative twenty one point appearance, which you know kind of put me in a hole early. Um, no, yeah, the big story obviously. You know, right as he finally actually had a good week, like I feel like this was the best week I've seen out of Ronald, Ronald Acuna. He tears the ACL. He's done for the season. Um, you know, obviously we'll see what we do with this uh, outfield hole, but it is a bit unfortunate. I can't be too mad because if you drop if you drop eight hundred sixteen points, you're probably going to win ninety five percent of the time. I mean, you know, four hundred fifty point fifty nine points from the bats, like. Uh, you know, John Heitz and then another 357 from the arms. Can't be too mad. But looking at John's team, I mean, kind of just what he said, his team just played a little bit better, came down to a couple of things. Uh, Aaron Judge, you know, popped off. I think he had four straight games with a homer. He had 83 points. Uh, Marcel Zuna still doing his thing. Matt Olson started to catch fire, especially towards the latter half of the week. And then pitching, um, you know, he said Ronald Blanco came in with a huge start today. Uh, Marcus Stroman with a 70-point week, which was big. And then, like you say, got a lot of reliever points. Uh, Ryan Walker, Luke Weaver with over 20. Tanner Scott with a 37-point week. And then he got a couple of saves from Paul Seawald and Kyle Finnegan as well. You know, this is uh, – you know, we'll see what happens with my team after Cunha, but this was a match between two potential, you know, title contenders. We played last year in the championship. Definitely lived up to the billing, and we'll see what happens in the future. But – we're going to switch things over. This was a very tightly contested week if you are, haven't been tuning into the pod that much. But we're going to look, we're going to head over to El Paso, where the smelly, where the smells El Paso Chihuahuas took down the Oklahoma City 89ers. Uh, uh, smell currently leading 523 to 507. Nolan Gorman is still, you know, playing for Smell and. Chad does have a couple of players as well, but this game looks out of reach, although that could potentially change. But big win for Smell. I felt like, you know, obviously he's a team looking towards next year. And for Chad, this felt like a really big must-win week, you know, especially with a lot of the middle-of-the-pack standing shaken out as well. We'll talk about it later. A lot of the teams ahead of him who were only game ahead of him lost, he picks up the loss as well. But, you know, a bit of a low-scoring week for Chad. But what did you see – in this matchup. Uh, John, I'll start with you. Yeah, this was definitely a fun one. And shout out to Smell. Um, the Bats really woke up for him this week. And I think Chad really was expecting a little bit more from the Bats, uh, as we've seen in previous weeks. Um, obviously, he's kind of on the, the, the verge now of breaking through with guys like Paul Skeens finally in the majors and a bunch of the young Rangers. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, guys on Smell's team, Mark Vientos had a 40-point week. You had uh, on Colorado, Brenton Doyle had almost 50 points. Ezekiel Tovar, 58. So really tapping into that young Colorado court, you know, at, at Coors Field, being able to get those points there. You talked about Gorman and France. And the craziest thing, too, because I've been looking through everything, is Chad outscored Smell's pitching by almost 100 points. Um, Chad obviously led by guys like Paul Skeens. Yamamoto had a two-start week. Um, he has Josh Hader, had a 38-point week alone. Joe Ryan had a great start. Lynn had a great start. The pitching was really there for Chad, which has been such a huge improvement for him over the course of the offseason, as well as Severino had a good start as well. Um, but some, some also talent performances for Smell at the same time. Bailey Falter has been good. He had a 30-point week. Um, Reese Olsen been one of the best pitchers in baseball this season. I think he's got like a 190 ERA or something. So he got the starts when it mattered. Um, and ultimately, it was really Smell's bats that catapulted him into this position that he's in. Um, it just definitely was an off week for Chad for his bats because you had guys like Daniel Lau only had seven points, Bell with nine, um, Westberg, he had 31, so not bad, Swanson with 10. Um, I know Langford's been hurt, so he hasn't been playing. Carter has, didn't play well either. Um, so definitely a winnable week for Chad, one he'll probably want back because it, it was so close and his pitching played so well. But shout out to Smell for really pulling away with his bats. And Connor. 
I think the surprise for me in this matchup is in back-to-back weeks, Chad has been under 300 points for hitting. We've discussed that usually these rebuilding clubs have the hitting figured out, but maybe not as much the pitching side. Chad's almost come out of his rebuild backwards where the pitching has seemingly been a little more consistent. So I do think Mel's won back-to-back games. He was ranked last coming into a lot of the power rankings, but his teams put up a good fight. Um, some very key um, waiver wire ads. Brent Doyle, 48 points, have been on the team for a while. Ezekiel Tovar, he got a while back, 58-point uh, week. And just decent pitching overall, a quality start from Patrick Corbin, one of my least favorite players in the league. So I do think that, I'm going to be curious to see if Chad is going to acquire bats or run the course as is. And for smell, good stuff. Uh, let's see if this continues for a third week. No, yeah. I mean, it is interesting, like you said, because a lot of times when we talk about these teams who are rebuilding or, you know, haven't kind of reached that upper echelon yet, we always talk about how the, the bats are there, but they really need to get the pitching going. I think Chad's arms are pretty you know suitable i mean almost 300 points from your arms you know 279 is a little under 300 but for most contenders that's kind of a little around the sweet spot maybe you'd like a little more but like you said you know paul Skeens has been absolutely dealing you know since he got called up joe ryan had a great start i believe today you know looking at luis severino somehow got a quality start somehow yamamoto had a two-star week josh Hader came in with a with 38 points and a save you know, I don't I don't think the hit the pitching is the problem. The bats, like you said, you know, haven't come into play. Evan Carter, I know, has been kind of in and out of the lineup as well, alongside Wyatt Langford. Christopher Morell really didn't do a whole lot as well. Danzy Swanson only had two bats that scored over thirty actually three bats, excuse me, scored over thirty points, and that was Jordan Westbrook, Hyson Kim, and then Luis Garcia. You know, you kinda need some more heavy hitters. Uh obviously Chad has the assets to work. Um Will be interesting to see how he approaches the, the next couple of weeks. Is he someone who wants to be more aggressive, pushing for that final playoff spot, or is he gonna wait out another year? You know, recuperate some assets for some of these older guys who maybe aren't part of his long term vision. I'm not entirely sure, but then looking at Smell, uh, I don't want to repeat myself or what you guys are saying, but you know, good performance by the bats, 328, pretty impressive. Zeke Tovar really seems to start hitting his stride. I know he's someone who's getting bounced around a lot and looks like, you know, it found a home in El Paso, at least for the time being. Mark Vientos, huge week as well. Finally, you know, finding a cog in that Mets lineup. And then for the arms, Javier Saad uh, pitched a nice little performance today for the, you know, got, you know, pitched all right for the, the Cubs today. Bailey Falter came with a quality start and a win against the Braves. Reese Olson, like you said, pitched well as well. And then Jeremiah Estrada, who pitched, I don't even, you know, he pitched, I think Smell picked him up today, or I know he pitched today, had five straight strikeouts, uh, got 21 points in one outing, which is huge, and picked up the win for the Padres as well. Yeah, he picked him up on the 24th, so two days ago. Uh, so, yeah, good stuff by Smell, getting on the win column. Chad, like you said, wish you can get that one back. But we're going to shift things over. We're actually going to talk about, uh, you know, the uh, the third podcast host today or the third podcast member today as the Amarillo Saab Poodles came in and upset the Nashville Sounds 604 to 579. Connor still has a couple players going, so that score could uh, increase maybe just a little bit. But, I mean, Connor, big, big stuff out of your team this week. 328 points from the bats, 276 out of the arms. Getting the win over Tita, a playoff team. What, what what are your give us give us your initial reaction on your your squad's performance this week? I mean, I'm very happy with it. There are certainly some ups and downs. Um, this year, I try to make a concerted effort to buy low, and a lot of some of these hitters that got off to struggling starts, and in some cases, I think they have done pretty well. Paul Goldschmidt with 47 and counting, Ian Happ with 36, Kerry Carpenter, the Tita Killer, with 49. And pitching wise, um, I've gotten some decent waiver wire ads that have since stuck in the rotation. For Tita, I think um, 
there are definitely some great pieces here. The Sounds are on a losing streak, and the next couple weeks won't be easier. But I do think that he is going to find a way to get going with this. Um, 600 points for the second time this year. I'm happy that Mark's been eclipsed. And uh, let's see how competitive the team is against some of my uh, tougher matchups coming up. Yeah, this was definitely a really fun one to watch unfold throughout the week. And Connor and Teeter are both, you know, two of the, the honestly, really the better managers of, of the league in terms of just roster management and, and buying, you know, at the correct time. And we know both of them love to trade and seeing how their teams unfold each week. Um, but first on with Connor's team, um, I mean, the bats, uh, assuming everything holds up, I know it's in the top of the eighth right now, Tita's bat, bats outscored Connor by one point. But the big improvement as well is Connor's pitching starting to get a little bit better, um, especially compared to last year. Outscored Tita's arms by 26 points. Um, you had guys like like Cal Quantrill had two decent starts, I think two 30-point starts. Um, on Cleveland, you had Ben Lively had another two-star week, really, really efficient stuff there. Um, and definitely just you're seeing these subtle improvements, which is leading to now to some 600-point weeks for Connor. Um, but yeah, that mindset of buying low on some of these guys and, and really hitting home on them, you're seeing it. I, I like Harry Carpenter. He's been playing well for me as well in Seattle. Dylan Moore has been really good um, the last couple of weeks. He had almost 60 points this week as well. Um, so Connor, again, very good manager. And you're seeing unfold in some of these big wins now. He's starting to pile up and now against Tita. In terms of Tita, um, still so many good pieces on this team. Um, I don't know. And every single time he's lost, he says he's blowing it up. He really shouldn't because there's still a lot to work with here and, and a lot of good pieces to potentially move or maybe even upgrade. Um, love Christian Walker. He had almost a 50 point week. And then as 33, Dalton Varshall and Verdugo combined for 100 points between the two of them. Um, but I think some costly pitching performances kind of hurt him. Reed Garrett kind of fell off now. You know, the whole Mets bullpen has fallen off with Diaz included. Reed Garrett had negative 22 this week. Um, that definitely hurt. I mean, he would have been like almost at the same point total as Connor. Um, if if not for that, you had a guy like Gavin Stone only had five points this week. Um, a, a couple OK starts. I mean, Bassett and Anderson pitched really well. Lopez pitched uh, pretty good between the at least one of the starts this week. The the last one only had four points. Um, so still plenty to work with here for Tita. There's a reason why um, he was already considered a playoff team, and then he beat me as well. So. I still wouldn't panic, just do the Tita method of, of continuing to accumulate assets and improve the team week by week, which he's always done. So definitely something to look out for for the remainder of the year. Now, I remember, and you talked about this, John, when you are saying that the parity in this league's really improved. I mean, we saw Smell picked up a nice win, and Connor's team's really starting to hit stride. There's a lot of the team, you know, because of where the league was last year, some of these owners leaving and people taking over, I feel like the parity's gotten a lot, like, you know, better. Obviously, you still have your really good teams, and you have a couple of bad teams. But I think a lot of the middle, of the, the the bad teams aren't as bad as they were last year. And the middle of the pack is a lot bigger. Um, I you know I said Connor just due to his shrewdness as an owner. Uh, my preseason rank, and I'd say he was going to beat a contender. Now, obviously, you know we'll see where Tita falls up in the hierarchy. I still think he'll be a playoff team because he's always puts himself in a position to win, and you know just his shrewd, you know his his wheeling and dealing always puts him in a good spot, but. Connor, like you said, picked up a big win this week. Um, you know, the really a balanced effort. You know, two hundred seventy six four points from the arms, which is somewhat solid. Three hundred twenty eight from the bats. Um, good stuff all around. Ben Lively, two star week, got sixty two points. You mentioned Cal Quantrill. He actually, you know, diced up the the red hot Phillies this week, and he gave. And I think they gave the Phillies their first like series loss in probably close to a month. So good stuff on that. Bryce, or Bryce Wilson. Had a 25-point – he didn't start, but he came in as like a, you know, secondary to an opener. Had a nice little outing there. Jeff Hoffman, who making the case as one of the most underrated uh, relievers in baseball, 26 points this week. Uh, Austin Gomber, another quality start for him, a quality start for him, 35. Looking at the bats, Paul Colchman, I know, absolutely raked today. Uh, 27 points at two homers in that Sunday night baseball game. Kerry Carpenter as well. Then Dylan Moore. One of those shrewd acquisitions. He's someone I know who's probably hit the waiver wire a couple of times. I'm looking right now, how many times he's been kind of at a drop. But, you know, he's someone who wasn't really highly regarded. Comes in, you know, five and a half point bats. Yeah, I mean, actually, I dropped him. I dropped him a week ago, and, and uh, Connor picked him up. So, shout out to Connor on that one. 
Um, and looking at T's team, like you said, you know, 579, you would have liked a little bit more from the arms. You've already mentioned Reed Garrett really, you know, didn't do well. Darius Fines, I know, got option. Gavin Stone didn't have a great start. Uh, Joe Ross got, like, was the opener for Bryce Wilson. Got her, and now he's on IL. Cole Irvin didn't do that well, but there were some spot. There were some, you know, spot highlights in this performance. I mean, the bats did their thing. Uh, Alex Verdugo, you know, they were somehow being internally underrated, 58 points. Dalton Varsho had almost a 60-point week as well, and he, we talked about Christian Walker being an absolute dog. So, tough loss for Tita, um, you know, and Connor cementing himself. I think he's now, is he 3-5, and 4-4? Four and four? I'm take, trying to take a look right now, excuse me. Picking up three and five, you know, you know, only a game behind a playoff spot, especially with some of these other uh, games shaking out. But shout out to Connor on that one. Uh, and, yeah, we'll see what, what both those teams do. Now, looking over towards uh, another exciting matchup, but an actually come back from behind matchup. I, I, I don't know how much he was down. I'd have to double check. But our commissioner, our LM, Cody, and his Bowling Green Hot Rods come back and beat the Rocket City Trash Pandas 608 to 573. This was a game I had been watching really kind of all day or all week to, you know, I noticed Homco took a big lead. Um Cody during the weekend really cemented himself at a outscored Homco by 140 points uh on Saturday alone. Um, you know, doing you know. what he to, to to get the win, remain undefeated. Eight and no, we'll see how that holds up. Um, but yeah, the commissioner getting it job done. Uh, John, what do you see? Yeah, same thing as you, Ryan. I really was looking out for this, and you know, there was a, a strong chance that Cody might have gotten his first loss of the season. But in the end, you know, I think the true strength of Cody's team will always be his pitching. And in the end, he outscored uh, Homko's pitching, I believe, by like seventy points towards the end. Just got some huge performances from some big time starters. Um, Gilbert with 38, Mackenzie Gore 42, Hunter Green with 32. Um, I mean, his he's probably got the best bullpen in the league. We've been saying that for a long time. Um, Mason Miller with 33, Manuel Classe with 49, Jesus Christ. Uh, Duvall with 18. Just the pitching really will can help him contend, I feel like, in any matchup, no matter what. And obviously, his bat still had 300 points this week. Um, but, and, Again, for Homco, kind of the inverse of Chad's team, where the bats were there, had almost 350 points. And like I mentioned, the arm just outside of, uh, uh, what's his name, Brian Wu of Seattle, who had a 57-point week. Um, and Sonny Gray with 56. Guys like Cutter Crawford had negative six. Hugh Darvish got lit up by the Yankees that one game. Um, had some okay performances from Charlie Morton and, and Sean Manaya. Tyone had seven. Um, just the pitching wasn't fully there this week, which I think ultimately hurt him. Um, but guys for his bats, like Glaber Torres had a good week with 40. Michael Harris and Tias Hernandez with 42 as well each. Um, Duran of Boston with 47. Um, and outscoring Cody's bats, it's always an impressive feat. But again, Cody's pitching, you know, probably still the best rotation in the league. I think he still has that title just from the depth and the star power that we've been talking about, you know, for, for the, the entire year was there. And I think the bats are still going to keep waking up as well. I mean, you had guys like Freddie Freeman only had 30 points this week. Um, but Bo Bichette's starting to get hot. He's got, he had 60. Jazz and Machado had 40 points each. Um, for Tatis only had 30. So there's still a lot of room for improvement for the bats to really wake up and kind of be like they were the first couple weeks of the season. Um, and ultimately for me, good teams find ways to win. And Cody found a way to win this week. And that's all he'll really care about. And the hot rods remain undefeated. And Connor. Yeah, I think the main thing here is we kind of lauded Homco this offseason for some acquisitions and really solidifying um, being one of that like six or seven seed um, playoff teams. And this year just hasn't gone as expected. The pitching names are better, but the results just aren't. So 234 points for a team that was trying to make the playoffs isn't good enough. Um believe Homco's currently now um uh what's the record? Two and six. So that's not a great start. We just saw um Jeremy Pena get sold to Tita and I'm very curious to see if they're 
other moves, I think the bats can get some nice stretches. And then for Cody, you have a great, I love the phrase, these teams figure out how to win. Cody's had a couple subpar weeks by his standards. 606 points this week. I believe both uh, in the Cheetah matchup, both teams were under 600. So, but Cody still figured it out and um, it's he's in the first class of the league. No, yeah, Cody definitely, you know, got out of the mud, as they say. You know, this was something I was looking at because obviously we talked about Homco, you know, really been struggling all year to really, you know, especially first two months, uh, kind of crazy thing about worrying two months into the season, struggling to get on the board. And we are wondering, you know, what would happen. And, and, you know, Cody obviously had been dominating thus far and thought it could have potentially happened, but. You know, coming out, uh, like you said, it really came down to pitching. 302 pitching points. Emmanuel Classe, just absolutely dominant. Mason Miller, even with getting up 300 runs, still had 33 points in that glitch uh, SP spot. Got a nice quality start from Matt Gore. Two quality starts from Logan Gilbert. You know, and then looking at the side of Homco, uh, you know, got two good starts from Sonny Gray, but Cutter Crawford had a negative start. Like you said, you Darvish got really lit up. Uh, John Means only at eight points, and he's now going to the IL. Um, you know, really only good performance he got from his, you know, his best performance came obviously from Brian Wu uh, as well. And you know, the bats they did their thing for inch thirty nine points. That's good, good performance by the bats. Uh, you know, solid all around. No one really stood out, but everyone seemed to be chipping in their part. But meanwhile, Cody, you know, was able to get away with three hundred six batting points. You obviously expect a lot more from guys like Fernando Tatis Jr. I mentioned. Uh, Freddie Freeman, he did get a good Bo Bichette week. So we'll see what happens with, you know, we'll see what Homco does. Like you said, he already traded Jeremy Pena, which maybe we'll talk about. But, you know, Cody extending his winning streak to 8-0. We'll see if he can continue the run. But we're going to jump now to, you know, we talked about tightly contested matchups. The, all three of these games have been very close. But we're going to break down Dave's Rochester Red Wings taking all defeating Scott's Richmond Flying Squirrels on a nice little barn burner, 474. Dave defeating Scott, 471. I'll actually start things off here. Dave, uh, just able to scrape by, really was the bats. None of their arms really did a whole lot. Uh, Only 187 pitching points from Scott compared to 173 from Dave, but the bats just did just enough for him to separate himself. Carlos Correa had a really nice week, 56 points. Uh, He's starting to you know, he found his groove, you know, starting to kind of maybe get back into the swing of things. Uh, William Contreras, I know he put him on the trade block. He, I think he's catcher one, or at least was catcher one for a while. Um, Byron Buxton, 32 points coming back from injury. Um, and then looking on the side of, of Scott, you know, Lars Newbar went down, uh, was ruled out for today's Sunday night baseball matchup. Uh, you know, three points could have swung the difference, but Obviously, you didn't want to come down to that. Um, you know, got some yep. good by Bryce Harper, who's really just been hitting his stride. Fifty-three points. Uh, you know, that's someone, especially if Scott wants to kind of rebuild or you know retool or sell at the deadline. That's someone I know he'll get a lot of assets for, especially because I think he was kind of bought for a low, and I think he's a seven and a half point bat, if I'm not mistaken. But he's been doing really well recently. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned, the pitching really didn't, uh, for either side, really didn't wow in either aspect. Uh, Hunter Gaddis was the the highest scoring pitcher on either side with 35 points, and he's not even a starter. He's a reliever, so that's kind of what we're dealing with right now. Um, but it just seemed like Dave had a little, just had just enough to kind of take himself over the edge. John, what what'd you think? Yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure if you're going to me or not. Um no. for the for the for this matchup, um again, Dave got the win. Um you're looking at some of the, the pitching mat uh, pitching performances. So Scott actually outscored Dave's pitching. Uh it looks like by fourteen. Um, but you still had guys like Michael Walker turn in twenty four points, Bailey Ober twenty, Montgomery twenty four, just some consistent performances, Flaherty with twenty three as well. Um, really love to see this resurgence of Jack Flaherty this year as well. He's been really good on a on an interesting Tigers team where getting some wins here and there, but it's mostly just racking up a shit ton of strikeouts. 
um, for sure. And for Scott, I still love some of these bats that he has. You talk about Bryce Harper, um, big C.J. Abrams guy. I know he's in a slump right now, but um, definitely a really good building block to, to have for the future. Um, Solaire and Mountcastle gave him 30 points apiece. Um, but it kind of just was some bad luck towards the end. Um, and really, and one thing I just noticed, I mean, the real reason, Dave had 12 starts to Scott's eight. So if Scott had one more start, I mean, definitely two, he probably would have won um, outside of maybe the pitcher, you know, blowing up on the mound or something like that. So um, I think that really is the ultimate deciding factor for this one. If Scott had a couple more starts, um, not not even hitting the 12, but maybe just hitting 10 um, for, for safety purposes, I think he would have gotten the win this week. But shout out to Dave for, for securing the tight dub and uh, getting in the win column. And Connor. So the theme that the pods talked about the last three weeks is Dave sniping pitching when possible. And that it's the only way to analyze this matchup. That is why he is the winner for this. Uh, Ryan Papaya, six points, not too bad. I think he was just coming off of an injury. Jordan Montgomery got 24. He was acquired from me. Bailey Ober with 20. He was acquired from Tita. All of these new pitching additions are going to help. And I do think Dave's team tends to rise the occasion. A couple weeks ago, he scored 600 points against John's team. And uh, these last two weeks have been under 500 points. So I'm curious what the ceiling for Dave's team is. And I think it's a bright future for Scott. Um, I think he was out of the country the first couple of days. So I do think that pitching's going to need to be acquired there. But. I do love the Bryce Harper edition uh, Scott had this offseason and do th- would be curious to see how long he's kept first, maybe flipped for a haul or first some more pitching. No, yeah, the point on pitching is very, you know, noted. I think that's something we've kind of, I mean, you talked about that's been something that's been something brewing for a while. Uh, seems like, you know, he, he has some starters, but I feel like he's always kind of struggling. <laughs> Well, actually, I think he went over the limit last week, I believe. But, um, you know, he's got a couple of start. you know, didn't get the starts he needed. And obviously being out of the country is a disadvantage. I think that was something that was even talked about in the preview of just how well were they going to do. Um, you know, obviously, Robert Gasser seems to be doing well. And he's someone who's kind of on Scott's prospect pool. Maybe he gets called up. I know he's starting against the Cubs tomorrow. I was just looking to see what the arms were looking like. So we'll definitely see. He has some kind of. Back in the rotation, guys who have been generally good, Taiwan Walker, Chris Sanchez, you know, Michael King's been really good coming over from New York in that uh, Juan Soto trade, not making it look like a complete dud on, uh, on uh, his end, but definitely something to kind of keep out for and look out for as we uh, head into this. And, I, and I'm actually, you know, I, I want to, I want to, um, we're sitting on the Paul and Bry matchup because actually I think Seiya Suzuki is set to bat. Uh, He's not batting right now. He's on deck, but we will. We'll wait. Uh, Suzuki flied out, so Bry is going to win. No, I well, no, no. It, Paul had taken the lead with Suzuki. You say he flew out because well, he's got Helsley. Flew out, so Hel- Helsley's going to get the save, and Bry is going to win. Yes. Yeah, so. So yeah. So I think. I guess we'll wait. I think the the score will be. What would it be? Plus 12? Yeah, let's just do like one more matchup and then go to yeah. that one so we have the final score. We'll wait to touch the final matchup. It looks like Bry will be Paul, but we'll we'll quickly touch on this matchup because uh, uh, no offense to our uh, our our uh, our friend and ally, Bracton, uh, but he fell to Jabs Portland Sea Dogs 744 to 346. Um, I mean, if you just want to talk about – if you want to throw out one number that really – exemplified this matchup uh jack bats outscored Braxton's entire team 441 to 346 um you know a lot of stud performances all around juan soto had a nice you know series revenge series against the padres Corey seager lighting it up vlad Guerrero jr finally kind of getting things going and then you know and then obviously he he had some stuff with the arms as well 303 points uh spotlight specifically we talk about um Tanner Houck with a 68.2 start week 
Andrew Abbott in his revenge game against the Bismarck Larks, 32-point quality star. I know Bracken's probably punching himself for that one. Uh, Tanner Bybee, 29-point star. I know that was a controversial trade last week. Some people thought he may have uh, given, up, given a bit too much, but nevertheless, that did happen. And Dean Creamer uh, did have a negative start, and he will be heading to the IL. So with a team that's been dealing with some, some pitching woes, losing him is not great, but he did get some good reliever performances. Uh, Brian Abreu, uh, 17. Kenley Jansen, 27. And then looking at Brackton, he got a great week from Ryan Weathers. Actually had more than half his pitching points, which is both kind of crazy and also kind of shocking at the same time. And then the bats, you know, Anthony Volpe still continued to do his thing, kind of proving everyone wrong. But, yeah, I mean, not a whole lot to break down this matchup. Obviously, you have a team trying to compete for the top half and then Brackton who's really just looking towards the future. Yeah, in this matchup, um, I think it tells you a lot more about Jab um, right now, where, again, 441 bad points is absurd. Um, the pitching, hitting 300, I think he really, that sweet spot is, is that 350 mark plus. Um, so I think, like, if Luis Castillo does better than one point, Kramer, obviously, is down, but a better performance. Bryce Miller had only at five. Um, those guys wake up the next time he has, like, a performance like this, he's going to crack. Um, at least 350 pitching points, and maybe even hit 800 points total as a team. The bats are unfair. Talk Soto. I want to highlight Bobby Witt, who's just fucking nuts. I mean, he's the fourth overall bat right now at 86 points. Just absurd stuff. Um, and for Brackton, you know, it's all about the assets, about the youth he's trying to build. Anthony Volpe is, you know, a top 20 bat in baseball right now in the scoring, which we love to see. Ellie had an off week, only at 20, so that didn't help. Um, you know, he's still trying to collect these young bats, which he's done a very good job of. And ultimately, you know, the, the biggest thing he's got to improve on. And you got you got to think maybe this offseason where maybe he turns the corner to really try to compete next year um, is he got to build up the pitching again. I, he knows he's got a lot of those homegrown arms he's trying to do um, with a lot of these prospects, which might take a little bit. Um, but adding, you know, a couple more arms to this rotation because Christian Scott is, is really good. I really like him. 25 points this week. Ryan Weathers isn't bad. Um, you know, only had the eight starts. Um, I think if he just continues to build up that pitching staff, you know, the Lars could be making some noise soon. Yeah, I think there's really not too much to talk about. I, I'll highlight one player from each team. The fact that Vlad Guerrero Jr. is now back at it for the Sea Dogs is really going to be a lot. Um, since Costas is injured, having the first base down for that team is going to be a very important one. Competing against the upper tier, and then, yeah, I think a lot of Christian Scott is going to be the pitching future for the um, Bismarck Larks. I'm very, since Brackton has focused on, like, a few high-end assets rather than going wide, I think, I'm not sure how much room there will be to maneuver, but I think this team is going to have its ups and downs, and um, 346 points or whatever is definitely a down, but let's see what the Larks do in the weeks ahead. Yeah, we'll definitely see what they do. And also, just pointing out Juan Soto, as, as obviously with the recent Acuna news, it, it's, it's even more uh, bitter sum of how well Juan Soto has been doing. That was the one piece, uh, you know, that I really felt bad giving up at the moment. Uh, but, you know, he's just been absolutely killing him. We're trying to, still trying to get a final verdict on this uh, this matchup between uh, between Bry and Paul still has not loaded. But, I mean, if you're talking about another banger of a game, I mean, just looking at the week in general, I mean, it's, you know, we have four games decided by 40 points, or five matches, excuse me, decided by 40 points or less. Uh, three of those were within 20. Two of them were within five. And, I mean, me and John's matchup was even close up until I'd say the last day where, you know, we were back and forth. So. An absolute crazy week in general. Uh, two teams trying to contend for the top uh, on a four-game win streak heading into this uh, 7-8-4, but Bry just able to get him, take him down with that Ryan Helsley save opportunity. And so, I mean, we could break down this game. I mean, 442 points from the bats. From, that's the most shocking part to me, I'd say, because we always I always talk about how great his arms were. 
And I mean, they did amazing as well. If I can get the final tally, uh, 341, not even including the Ryan Helsley save right away. Um, uh, now it's 792 to 784. So just got the ups- updated score. So 350 from the arms, 442 from the bats. Um, you know, just crazy stuff. Michael Garcia, very underrated player, uh, 63 points. Um, Luis Arias, I know he's someone who is very controversial, called a singles merchant in this league. Um, 515 of 31 with 12 of those sets, 63 points. Um, Julio Rodriguez in a revenge game against Paul hit a homer, I think, today exactly. Uh, and he's start, starting to get a little better now, uh, starting to find his groove a little bit more. And then looking at arms for Bry, uh, Ranger Suarez, uh, got a quality start, kind of got lit up today, but still had 59 points. Cole Reagan's another great start from him. His bullpen just absolutely dominant. We talked about Helsley picking up that, that save in the end. But Robert Suarez also with four points. But, you know, Paul, I, I think similar to my matchup, you really can't beat yourself up too much for this. I mean, 784 is going to win you a lot of weeks. Uh, you know, some weeks it might even be the, the most points you score in a week. It's just that we had a very high-scoring week. Um, Kyle Bradish really getting back into form. 71 points in a two-star week. Logan Webb had 64 in a two-star week. Uh, Luis Gill, 71, or 44 points, excuse me. Kevin, uh, Kevin Gosman, another quality star, 43 for him. 381 points from the bats. Brian Reynolds with 47. Spencer Steer with 47. A bit unfortunate for Paul, but, you know, someone had to lose this matchup. Connor, what would you think? Yeah, I think this is the second matchup we've talked about where you're kind of shaking your head on, well, how did a team that scored that many points lose? Um, Bri, we've raved about his team for weeks, and Paul had had a three- or four-game win streak before this. Uh, Gunnar Henderson with 37 points and 18 at-bats. Brian Reynolds with 47 points and 28 at-bats. Logan O'Hoppy delivering some solid numbers like the. 380 points from the bats is going to win most leagues, and then 400 um, pitching points is crazy. Paul likes talking about um, elite teams having good bullpens, and Joan Duran having 37, Bednar 26, and AJ Minter with 18. That is going to do it pretty well. Um, I think I'll say the difference might have been Bry's um, waiver ad. With the new rules, I think it's been a bit limited, but people like Jacob Latz, Jared Koenig, Randy Rodriguez, those relievers and smart timing added up. So I do think, yeah, there's no reason for Paul to take this super hard, but um, it's a great matchup, and I think the better team did win here. Yeah, first, starting with Bry, I love the improvements with the bats. Um, Almost 450 points is absolutely absurd. Um, for him, I mean, J.J. Bleday's been hot lately. I mean, he had 35 points this week. Um, uh, Michael Garcia, top 14 bat in baseball in our scoring right now. Absolutely absurd. He's got Albies, who's so good, 40 points. Um, had some big-time pitching performances like we talked about as well. Um, hit that 350 mark, that sweet spot. Um, you know, the, the bullpen, what you guys talked about, really was is what did it in. And for Paul, I mean, the bats, almost 400 points is still really impressive. You already mentioned the bats. Um, but I'm going to get the pitching. There's two players that I feel like if they were themselves, Paul would have won by, I think, at least by a little bit. Um, George Kirby, only one point this week against the Washington Nationals. Um, definitely, you know, very unlike him. I've heard, I think Paul himself might have mentioned it, you know, a top five dynasty pitcher, which. I definitely could see the argument for that, and he, he probably is. Um, and I, I still think, yeah, at least in terms of baseball right now, he's a he's a top ten pitcher regardless. Um, and then Dynasty probably is because of his age in that five to seven range. Um, the last two weeks he had one point this week, negative one his last start against the Orioles. Um, then he had a forty piece, then a four point piece. It's a little bit inconsistent here and there, um, and I think that really hurt him this week. I mean, he 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 has you know ten points. Paul wins. And also, you talk about how good his bullpen is, which, you know, Duran, Bednar, Mint are absolutely filthy. I definitely think this Edwin Diaz regression is also going to hurt a little bit um, as he's trying to find himself again, where he's kind of in the, in the middle of the, the bullpen now before he gets to that closer spot again. 
Um, because when Edwin Diaz was on, I mean, when Paul especially was having Diaz go on that run, it was just absolutely insane. I'm pretty sure Paul had him at that point. But, you know, whoever had him, Diaz was just unstoppable. And, you know, be- becoming that dominant closer, like closers that like Cody have, and guys like Klaus and stuff like that. It just adds a whole other element to it. Um, but Paul should not w- worry whatsoever. This would have been in most teams basically any other week. Um, I love his pitching a ton. I love Kyle Bradish. I love that this this Garrett Crochet resurgence. Gosman's going to be okay. But at least he'll be in the Cy Young conversation. Um, but you, you just need guys like Kirby to start waking up and pitching like George Kirby um, and just get some more timely performances out of guys like Edwin Diaz. And if he's able to turn around too, in addition to the bullpen he has now, Paul's going to be pretty unstoppable to beat, honestly. No, yeah, it really just, you know, came down to a couple things, not bouncing the way of, uh, bouncing in the way of uh, Paul, but that'll do it for this week's matchups. And absolutely, I think probably the best week we've seen thus far. It's like, you know, I mean, usually when we, you know, this is the first time in a while we've really been waiting for Sunday Night Baseball to kind of settle and figure out who's going to win, uh, or for a couple of matchups as well. Um Hold on, I'm actually. Hold on, I'm actually just seeing something crazy. Uh, I think Scott got credit with the win against Dave. What? Did I miss something? Hold on. Uh, Jojo Romero had a hold. Bro, that's crazy. Hold. Oh, wow. <laughs> so Scott, look at that! It was so close. We missed a hold. Damn. Sorry about that, Scott, but. Shout out Scott for winning four seventy six to four seventy four. Jojo Romero picking up a hold. Uh, I don't know why that took so long to process. I guess since they were waiting for the Cardinals to win, but missed. I mean, missed that in my uh, analysis. Sorry about that, uh, Scott and Dave. But no, yeah. I mean, the, just speaking to how crazy the the game was, we we thought a match settled and it hadn't. So crazy stuff to think about, but. That'll do it for the week eight matchup. Like I said, probably the best week we've gotten thus far. I mean, just absolute absurdity. Literally came down to the last pitch for a couple of these matchups. And I'm trying to find the, when this week started in terms of everyone's favorite section. So the 20th is, or I guess, yeah, the 20th is the first day of trade. So it looks like we are starting with, um, okay, yes. Yeah, so actually, this is a good trade to start with. So the first trade of our trade section is Bracton and Tita. Bracton gets Vaughn Grisham, Zach Neto, or Zach Neto, I believe, and Chris Paddock for Carson Williams and Ryan Clifford. Connor, I'll start with you. What what are your thoughts on this trade? Um, I feel like I'm lower on Carson Williams than a lot in the league. Um, very talented shortstop prospect with the. Rays, who has a great power-speed combo, but also has very high strikeout rates. So this is the first of two deals where there are three young pieces move for Carson Williams and also Ryan Clifford, a uh, hit-and-miss uh, Mets prospect. I lean Braxton here. I think this is exactly the move that he needs to get some more pieces um, to round out the pitching especially. Um, but I get why... Tita did it, and Tita later moved Carson Williams because, of course, he did. So I'm sure we'll chat about that as well. Yeah, for this matchup, um, Connor kind of took a lot of what I was going to say. Um, I'm not a big Vaughn Grissom guy. I, I know a lot of people are in this league. Um, but, you know, the way Chris Paddock's been pitching and just in terms of pure value, I know Bracton loves Zach Nito as well. Um, probably leaning a little more towards the Bracton side, but – I mean, Ryan Clifford's been one of those prospects. I think the Mets acquired last year when they were trading for some of those, uh, when they trading away some of those old pitchers. Um, and obviously Carson Williams, which we'll, we'll get to um, in the next part of T- when Tita traded him. Still a top 16 pitcher, um, not pitcher, uh, prospect in baseball. Um, and I think I, I actually heard Bracton say this word for word where he had too many good shortstop prospects, so he was going to have to move him eventually. I remember he was trying to move Carson Williams for a little bit, so he finally did it. Got some pretty good value out of it. Obviously, Vaughn Grissom's still young um, and, and the potential, and then obviously Paddock's been pitching out of his mind this year. So 
Um, definitely a, a, a pretty solid trade for both sides, but probably lean a little bit more towards Bracton. No, yeah, I would agree as well. Uh, I, I I do remember that conversation Bracton said, Bracton saying he has a lot of talented shortstops, and not even just in his prospects. Have Ellie and Volpe, who are really looking down the spots. Um, I do like Ryan Clifford. I with you know right now ranked as a top 100 guy around depending on how things shake out but get a guy you know Chris Paddock has had a very weird career but he's been doing very well this year for a team of Bracken who really just needs arms like I said I I, I think I like this for Bracken you pick up a couple other young middle infielders in uh, Zach Nito and you know really still out on them but you know, the fact that you're getting an arm plus, you know, you're, you're still getting those kind of lottery ticket guys. I, I do like this deal for Bracken, but I understand why Tita did it as well. So we're going to a bit. Uh, yeah, I think we'll jump to this deal. Um, I, was, well, I was involved in this deal where I picked up Trevor Williams for Gavin Cross and Griff McGarry. So I made this trade for a couple of reasons. One, I actually like what Trevor Williams had been doing this year and when Dave put him on the block, he originally said a worst. I was actually kind of shocked because when you get a guy who's, you know, a, a low, a high team, low 20s point per game pitcher uh, for two worst, I think that's a good value. I was also trying to max out my starts against you, John. <laughs> I was to what it's worth. It didn't, but, um, no, yeah, I mean, you know, Gavin Cross was someone I actually had recently added or I added maybe earlier before the season began. Someone had a lot of pedigree, really not as good recently. And at Griff McGarry, he's kind of, you know, someone that, who's kind of really hidden in that Phillies, uh, you know, pitching system. You know, they already have three, you know, Cy Young candidates in uh, Wheeler, Suarez, and Nola. Um, obviously, Andrew Painter's coming up. Mick Bell is coming up as well. And you still have a couple of back-end, you know, veteran guys as well. Really doesn't have a, you know, long-term uh, fit in the Philly system. So I wasn't really that mad giving them up. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on it. Yeah, the one thing I'll say um... – I feel like Trevor Williams is like a, a a better version of what Mikolas has been this season and kind of pitching in that way. Even fan tracks had a line that said, it's incredible what Williams is doing after years of mediocrity. Um, <laughs> that's It's actually allowed uh, yet to allow more than, I believe, more than three runs in a start this season which I want to double check. Yes, yeah, so he's only allowed three runs or less every single start this season, which is wild to think about. Um, so I feel like maybe if Dave sat on just for a little bit, kind of got a little bit more value because, you know, in previous years he was like an eight-point-per-game pitcher. Now he's almost 20, um, but still, you know, getting a couple of prospects for him. Uh, we don't know if he's going to keep this up. I highly doubt he's going to keep up that impressive stretch. So um, it, it worked out that he got a decent pitcher. Um, wasn't enough this week, but I feel like it'll still help you long term uh, to help your pitchings. Hank Connor, you got anything or no? I have nothing further to add. I think John absolutely nailed it. Okay, and you alluded to this earlier, uh, talking about you know uh, Connor in terms of uh, Ryan Clifford and Carson Williams getting flipped. So Tita gets James Triantos, Emmett Sheehan, and Ricky Tiedemann. For Ryan Clifford and Carson Wentz. So, if you want to do a little trade butterfly or trade, you know, diagram, it was Vaughn Grisham, Zach Nito, and Chris Paddock for James Triantos, Emmett Sheehan, and Ricky Tiedemann. But we'll focus solely on the, the you know, the, the Tita and Jab portion of it. Um, all right. If you want to relate to the other part as well, Connor, what did you think of this, uh, this deal from Tita? You know, doing some little asset management here. I mean, I think this is just a master class by Tita in asset management. Um, Emmett Sheehan uh, recently underwent Tommy John surgery, but he's a highly regarded Dodgers pitcher. Ricky Tiedemann, maybe the top left-handed uh, pitching prospect in baseball. So the fact that like one or both of those moved in the same deal for Carson Williams, I found absolutely shocking. Um, I know that Jab's a big Williams guy, but I just think this was an overpay since they're three top 100 or just graduated from that. Um, piece is going to the sound. And so we're, so, so we're starting with the one where it's Trianto, Sheehan, Tiedemann for Clifford yeah. Williams. Yeah, I saw you got, I saw you got booed out. Yeah, that's the trade we're talking about. Yeah, my Discord's being gimpy right now. Um, 
for that trade, um, I, I caught the tail end of what Connor said. I, I, I would have to agree with that. Um, you know, Clifford's, you know, decent prospect. Williams obviously has that pedigree, still has all that potential. Um, but I also really like Tiedemann. I still think he's got so much on tap potential. And, um, you know, I know he was a little bit inconsistent in the minors and battling some injuries, but I think he's going to be a really good starter. Emmett Sheehan as well. I always trust the Dodgers pitching lab, and I feel like that's what's going to stay like that. Um, Trianto's obviously a solid prospect as well. Um, so I also would lean T to side just a little bit here. No, yeah. I mean, I think the, you know, obviously you're dealing with a lot of prospects here, so you can't say really the best player, but I think the prospect with the highest upside, in my opinion, or at least, you know, highest pedigree right now is Ricky Tiedemann. Um, hasn't been getting off to the greatest start in AAA, but you know, only only a, a five six year and a couple, you know, really a couple of starts or one start, really. Uh, not a few starts, excuse me. Um, there's a possibility he might get called up at the end of the year. I don't know. It depends how he pitches AAA for the rest of the year. I know the you know the the back end of that blue Blue Jays rotation leaves a lot to desire. I know Alf Manoa has been kind of you know, but it's been doing a little better recently. Um, but you know I think the guy at the highest pedigree is Ricky Tiedemann. Edmund Sheehan was with is it with the Dodgers. Um, like you say, got Tommy John. So you know he's with. Tita won't be waiting on that for a while. He'll probably flip at some point if he hasn't already. Um, so, but he is someone who has had, you know, major league experience, pitched a lot last year. So, I like this deal for Tita. Like you said, a master class and kind of expert manager. When you get a, you know, a top three to five pitching prospect uh, and a guy who's, you know, pitches for the Dodgers in some capacity, if he remains a starter, that's always value in and of itself. Tita, but skipping down a little bit more, uh, Tita, our, our, our friend and ally, once again involved. I think he's been involved in every single – no, he hasn't. Every single trade we talked about. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, but um, Tita and Brackton, once again, getting added. Uh, uh, Tita gets Chris Paddock back, Craig Kimbrell, and Thomas Segesi or Sagis. Sagis, I forget. I don't know if, if someone can help me on that pronunciation. Sagesi. Sagesi? Thank you. Sagesi. Thank you. Uh, Bracton gets Ricky Tiedemann and Griffin Jacks. Um, obviously, Bracton uh, loves Ricky Tiedemann. I feel I, I don't know the counter on how many times he's acquired him, but I, I every time I ever talk to Bracton, he tells me how much he loves Ricky Tiedemann. Um, you know, he's more of a developmental arm, and, you know, obviously – you know, although we've talked about how highly of how highly pedigree brings, you, you know, you do have to have a little bit of patience because unless you're like Paul Skeens, you know, there will be some growing pains at some point. But I like to get for Bracton, Chris Paddock, you know, has been good. But, you know, also this is like kind of, you know, his best year in a while. Um, Greg Kimbrell is, you know, closer for the Orioles, which is does have value in of itself. But Bracton to get Another reliever back in Griffin Jacks, and then I assume Thomas Agassi, if I'm not mistaken, is a worse. So I like it. I, I get it for both sides. Tito wants the more win now, the win now players, and Bracken gets that 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 prospect arm that maybe maybe he'll hold on to uh, for the next, you know, for the foreseeable future. Yeah, hopefully Bracken keeps Tito in this time around. Um, not sure why he's moved him a bunch because he. That's probably his favorite pitching prospect in all of baseball, if, if I'm not mistaken. But, yeah, I, I'm not going to say too much more about this and kind of hit the nail on the head. Tita got more win-now pieces. Ken, Craig Kimbrell does stink, um, but he, he does have the value of being the Orioles' closer. But Paddock, you know, still has been really good this year. Bracton selling high on him. Bracton gets his guy at the end. I actually disagree with both of you on this. Um, for Bracton, the I think – roster building challenge will be how to create depth so the fact that two pitchers and i think thomas de is actually in the low end top 100 for at least pipeline um moving those three pieces for one pitching prospect that hasn't done a um had major league experience yet is a little bit concerning griffin jacks is a very solid uh setup man and would be the guy if john duran was injured um, and I do think the valuation's fine, but I don't like the fact that Bracton is consolidating pieces now. And I think 
the goal for the Larks would be to go the other way and diversify some assets a little bit. Okay, I I get what you're saying, and it does. I understand your point. I I do think it does make sense, Connor. It, and I think it's also just like the way. I think it's also the way he. I think he maybe wants to build and well, if he holds on to the team, it's one thing. It kind of sees the fruit of his labor. But if he does the thing where you know he he trades for a guy like Tiedemann and then maybe gets two and eight, flips him for less or equivalent value, then you know you're kind of just you know reshuffling the deck of cards to you know for a lack of a better analogy. So I do get that point of view. So we'll see how that plays out. But I do get your point of view, Connor. Um. But yeah, shortly right after that, uh, or you know, Tita getting to work once again as Paul gets Kyle Schwarber and Johan Oviedo for Randia Rosarena and Spencer Argetti. Um, obviously, there's a two-part trade because I see uh, Connor gets Randia Rosarena right after, which we'll talk about uh, in a second. But um, for this deal, uh, obviously, you're you're looking at both Schwarber and a Rosarena who really haven't you know, been themselves. I know Kyle Schrober, actually, I just saw this, I heard this stat today where Kyle Schrober is, go, is experiencing his route without a homer as a Philadelphia Philly. I think it's somewhere around 50-something at-bats without a homer, which, you know, is the, his longest stretch. And obviously he's a homer, really, he's a three-outcome guy. Um, hasn't really done a whole lot. And Randy Rosarena sitting at a four-point bat just really hasn't been able to get going. The whole race... Offense, I feel like it's been very sluggish at a lot of points. But, you know, if you're talking about fantasy value, I think a Rose Rain offers maybe a little bit more upside in terms of his, you know, offense or in terms of his base ceiling ability. But Kyle Schwarber obviously gets those homers, you know, performing better right now. Um, yeah, no, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's an interesting trade for both teams. I, I don't necessarily, you know, you know, I don't know which one would be the definitive player because you do have Spencer Argetti who has gotten that majors experience as well. Um, and he does play for the Astros, so I guess maybe that holds more stock than Johan Oviedo, who is currently injured right now. But yeah, it's a very it's a very interesting so- trade for both teams. I know Connor, you got a Rosarena, so let, let's. I'll, I want to hear your piece on the deal. Sure. So for Paul, um, I think both Paul and Tita are big Kyle Schwarber guys. And Arosa Reina is a talent the last couple of years has had close to 30, 30 seasons, but just has not looked good whatsoever this year. So I think Tita was perfectly happy to attempt to buy low and get an asset that he knew he could flip later. And Paul got a more steady guy. Kyle Schwarber is not going to continue to go through this. The home runs are going to come at some point so I think I prefer the Tita side because Randy has a higher ceiling than any other piece in the deal but um, I think it's a pretty fair setup yeah I'd have to agree with that Um, Randy I think he's like a four point bat right now which is very unlike him and you know I I was thinking I looked at this trade right away and I thought of last year if, if this trade had happened um, Schwarber was tearing the cover off the ball most of the year. Randy had a good year as well. Um, and just funny how a year later, where Schwarber, I think he's on, I think he's like a five point bat or five and a half point bat. And then Randy obviously struggling big time. It's just crazy to think how much a year difference can make. But Schwarber will be fine. He'll go on a stretch probably in like June or July where he'll hit like 10 home runs and, and whatever certain stretch. Um, but I, I do agree with Connor that Randy does have that higher ceiling. I think he's two or three years younger as well. Um, so probably slightly lean the Tita side, but if Schwarber gets hot again, which he will, um, Paul could really capitalize on that in terms of his team winning or selling high on him once again and you know, getting someone better than Randy potentially back in a trade down the line. No, I think it I, I think it makes sense. And I also think, you know, in terms of the pitcher as well, I mean, I think Spencer Argetti, you know, is able to get some action as well. But I do like the assessment. Um although I will say for the Age doesn't, I don't think matters as much because you look at Randy, he's a guy whose game does predicate on his speed. So, you know, those, those kind of players, while I'm not saying he's going to fall off drastically and maybe he already, you know, you're starting to see the decline, his game's more predicated on his athleticism, which declines is like, you know, in your early to mid 30s. Kyle Schwarber can just, you know, sit and, you know, hit homers and trot around the bases for 
a much longer period. So I don't think the age curve is as impactful in terms of, you know, these two futures, because I think Kyle Schober's game just has a little more longevity in general. But, you know, just 12 hours after the fact, Connor got himself uh, Randy Rosarina for Lane Thomas, Johnny DeLuca, and George Valera. Uh, John, I'll actually let you go first on this one. What do, what do you think? Uh, this was the trade that involved Thomas for Randy. Yes. Sorry, you cut out. Yeah. Um, so, again, I'm going to keep thinking to last year how, I mean, Lane Thomas, uh, you know, he was a beach dog legend last year, almost a thousand point bat, having a pretty brutal season so far. I mean, he's batting under 200, only two homers um, so far. Um, you know, Tita, obviously, you knew it was going to flip Randy at some point. Um, a little bit sooner than I thought he would, just because I thought maybe he'd wait till Randy got a, a little bit hotter um, to sell a little bit higher on him. But this is classic, just Connor buying low on, on a, a player that has had a, a good pass at some sort, and then will get hot eventually, which I think is going to happen over the summer. Um, and Connor did it once again, and I think he'll be really happy with Randy in, in a couple of months. Yeah, and I'll get, I'll get my piece before Connor. I want to hear your thoughts on this. But, um, no, yeah, I like the deal for Connor. Um, Lane Thomas obviously did beach dog like really went through the trenches with us last year, but he was someone he felt like a bit of an aberration. Uh, I mean, obviously he went down with that knee injury, and he he looks like he'll actually be activated within the next, uh, you know, expect you know might be back in the next couple of days or so, going through some rehab assignments. But, um, you know, it looked like his you know it looked like that season last year where he was a six a six point bat really felt like an outlier. Um, you know, George Valera's had a cup of coffee as well. And then, or not George Valera, excuse me. Johnny DeLuca's had a cup of coffee in the MLB. George Valera's someone who used to have a very high pedigree as a prospect. Um, you know, as, as, as you know, kind of in triple a right now, uh, struggling with the, in the guardian system. So, you know, I like it for, I think the Randy Rosarena offers a higher ceiling than, ceiling. than Lane Thomas, um, and I think, you know, even if they give you similar production, I don't think the assets he gave up really, you know, matter too much in the long run. So, yeah, that's my thoughts. Connor, what was your thought process when making this trade? Yeah, so it's kind of tough in this league when you have specs to, like, buy into the elite assets. Most of the biggest names only move for other big names. So Randy Rosarena has absolutely sucked this year, but in back-to-back years before, he was a very clear top 50 to 70 fancy asset. So um, Lane Thomas is a profile I just don't like. He's a leadoff hitter that has a low on-base percentage, steals a bunch of bases, and... Seems like he could get replaced in a year or two with Dylan Cruz and James Wood. So I think adding a couple worse essentially to him to get a guy who, yeah, maybe he isn't back to 2022 or 2023 levels, but has that ceiling was a really good fit. Now I just need to be patient and see if and when Rose Arena turns it around. No, yeah, and I, and I get it for you, and I like that asset. I mean, I agree with you where – you know, you're looking at a lot of these elite guys get moved for elite guys during your position where you're trying to build up. You, you got to make these savvy moves where you're you know, making a kind of a risk where you're giving up a couple assets and a guy who could play similar to him to try to bounce his way back up. But I like that deal for you, Connor. Um, you know, I, I can see why Tita did it, get a couple maneuver around. But I think we have one more trade I really want to get down into unless you really want to. <laughs> Um, if you don't, we can go into this last one that just happened as we were recording, uh, the Jeremy Pena trade, where um, Tita got Jeremy Pena for Jade Crawford, Brett Wachowski, or you know, yeah, Wachowski and Asquez. Um, we talked about Homco, you know, selling off Jeremy Pena after a really bad season last year is you know molding into a point bats. Um, Crawford has been someone, I mean, as someone who did own him, very slow start to the season, was injured for a good chunk of it. Um, not really playing like last year, uh, and he, but, but you know, Comco gets a couple of worse as well, so just building up that prospect pool in a sense. But 
I like it for T Day getting a, getting a nice upgrade in Crawford or not of Crawford getting a nice upgrade in Pena and, and you know trading off Crawford who is also four years older or three years older excuse me I like the deal for Tita but I understand why Hanko made. Yeah, I feel like for this trade, um, Jeremy Pena, I'm not sure if this was talked about in previous episodes, but um, only a 4.9 point bat last year, 740 after, you know, a pretty solid first year. Um, but this year, batting almost 320, six point bat right now on the Astros, who obviously have been struggling, but starting to play a little bit better. Um, you know, that's a big time get, and I think Pena is going to probably keep up with that. Um, he's only 26, so you, you got the. The, the young part of the trade as well. Um, but I, I probably will still lean Pena, um, the Pena side of the trade on this one. I'm not a big J.P. Crawford guy. Um, I don't think he's that great of a hitter. I do like uh, some of the prospects. Um, my Discord is bugging. Uh, the guy on the Brewers, so what's the guy? Brett, what's his last name? Richowski. Yeah, no, I like him as a prospect. Um, I know he had a really good spring training, and he, I know he's turned into – kind of like a big prospect riser. Um, so like him. So I, you know, I, I don't hate the Homco side. Um, so there's definitely some value there, especially in those prospects. Um, Crawford maybe can get a little bit hot, but um, in terms of, of the better, the, the best player of the deal and the better player, I'm going to roll a ping in. And Connor. Yeah, I think it's pretty fair for both sides. I mean, this offseason, Jeremy Payne was moving for two worse, and now he's one of the top five to seven scoring shortstops. Um, Ralphie Velasquez is a catching slash first base prospect in the Guardian system who's really impressed. So I think Comco is buying to high performing prospect names, and JP Crawford's kind of the shortstop throw in. Um, but so I get the deal for both sides, but if Tita is hoping to um, give Bri a matchup, or who, who is Tia facing next week? It's Bri. Oh, Paul. Okay. Paul then, Bri. Um, I think Payne is going to be a nice bat to help do that. Yeah. Nice transition, Connor, as now very, kind of short week for the trades, I'd say. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, me, I know for speaking for me, John, and Brack, at first, I know we were pretty busy ourselves, but yeah, I guess there was a lot of scoring that people didn't feel like they had to do some maneuvering on their end. But we'll now preview, I guess, this week's upcoming matchups. Um, We'll start with, in my opinion, the matchup of the week, the the battle of, you know, you know, two of the top four best teams in terms of record. Cody sitting at Green Hot Rods against the six and two Portland Sea Dogs. John, obviously, I think this game this game has a lot of implications for you as someone who's trying to reclaim that one seed. If Cody falls, that would really put some, you know, nice position you very nicely. What do you think is going to happen this week? Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, you know, ultimately, the goal is to just have a top two seed um, just to, to, to get the buy. I mean, obviously, I was a one seed last year. I, I'd like to be that again. Um, you know, the big thing is, and my gut was telling me jab at first, but um, what usually happens, and it's kind of the law of this league, and it's, it's happened to me. I had seen it with you, and I've seen it with Cody a couple of times, too, is when your team underperforms one week, you really – Usually, if you're you know an elite team, you wake up the following week, and I feel like that's what Cody's going to do after you know he barely squeaked by uh, Homco this week. I feel like this is like a seven fifty to eight hundred point week for Cody. Um, so I'm going to take Cody by within fifty points against Jab. Um, it's just because that that law, which I've seen so many times so far since I've been in this league, I feel like Cody's due to have a big week after. You know, it wasn't even just last week. You know, the Tita matchup was like under 600 points. Um, you know, obviously, I feel like his pitching is going to outscore Jab. I do think Jab's out bats are going to outscore Cody. Um, but I just feel like there's more certainty with Cody's pitching, and that could really make a difference in a matchup like this. So I'll take Cody for this week. Connor? Yeah, I completely agree with John's analysis. I think. Um, the Sea Dogs, after maybe a first couple weeks, consistently hit over 700 points. But Cody's um, team looks just seems like it's going to be 
looking for a fiery start. So I do think Cody's going to win this, but it'll be it'll be the highlight matchup for sure. So I am going to go a bit contrarian with you two, and I'm actually going to go with Jab, and this is why. Whenever I see a match between two teams who are very, very close in terms, you know, and I think Cody and Jab are, are position themselves as, you know, the, the elite team in the league. I like seeing who's got the two-star weeks. Uh, Jab has Brian Bayo, Bryce Miller, and Luis Castillo on two-star weeks. And the only two-star pitcher Cody has right now is Simeon Woods-Richardson. You know, it's not the NLB all, but I, that's something I like quantifying, looking to see that. Also, Cody only has 11 starts. I assume, especially if the matchup is close enough, Cody will get into a 12th start in there somehow. But I do think I do like Jab's team. I do like Jab's team. I do I do understand your sentiment of you know once you score like you know eight you know Jab almost scored 800 points this week and Cody barely cracked 600. I feel like when you have a team that does really good w- one week and then you know it's kind of regression to the mean. So I could see that playing, but I'm gonna go with Jab. I just like his. I like his I like his two starts over Cody's two starts. So looking at a next our next matchup, we're gonna you know go to our, our, our fan favorite Tita as he takes on Paul's Norfolk Kai, two teams who suffered, you know, you know, you know, heartbreaking losses. Tita obviously with the uh, again upset by Connor and Paul losing an absolute nail biter. To bride decided by a uh, you know a Ryan Helsley save. Um, both teams look like they do have their starts. Paul currently ten starts. Tito with twelve. Connor, what do you think this matchup. I Man, I think this is going to be a good test for Tita. The sounds are kind of on a losing streak, and if they're going to want to be a six or seven seed, Paul is kind. Of- who was the seven seed last year is a good matchup. I do think Norfolk wins this. They've just been so hot the last four weeks that they've been playing on a different level than the sounds have. But I do think that this is going to be a relatively close matchup. Yeah, I think it will be a close matchup, but um, I think adding Schwarber and the way Paul's pitching, especially, which again was so, so good against Bry um, and just couldn't beat Bry's unbelievable bats. Um, you know, I mean, Paul, like, again, Paul's team has been one of the hottest, if not the hottest in the league right now. Um, I feel like Paul is due for a, for a bounce back win. I would agree as well with that assessment. Um, I, I think that he is due, uh, not due. I think Paul's really positioned himself after a, a very slow start to get, get himself back into the fray. You know, like you said, this is a this is a big matchup for Tita because he's someone who I believe was he four and zero to start the season, four and zero was he three and zero something like that. Yeah, he start he started four and one has lost his last and the teams he's been I mean he's Connor and then he lost to me and you know he does have a couple of teams uh, up his back obviously you still have a lot of weeks left but the, this is when you really this is where you really start being you know where your team stacks up in terms of the upper half of the league. Um, yeah, I know Tita always wheels and deals to put himself in the best position to win this week. I know he'll do that, but I think, like you guys said, Paul's just been on an absolute tear. He's been, you know, excluding this loss, he's probably been one of the hottest teams in the league, and even in his loss, he scored in the upper 700s. I like Paul. I think he's going to take the win over the Nashville Sounds. And looking at our next matchup, as I accidentally exited it, the screen looking at week nine um yes we will head to where we want to head actually we'll we'll head over to the the match between our two podcast hosts or two of our podcast hosts as the amarillo Stop poodles take that da- take on the hartford yard goats i will actually go first because this matchup has no i have no you know indication of this matchup i'll let you guys speak first Obviously, Connor, uh, we you know, I've talked about this, and I've and I've told you this personally, and I've you know said this on the podcast. Uh, I love what you've been doing with your team. I think you know, looking at what you've done, you know, kind of positioning yourself, and obviously that huge win against Tita really helps you out. Uh, I think I got to go, with John. I always say, um, you know, I always go with John until he play unless he plays me. You know, even even though I've lost five straight, I'll still pick myself over John Height. But I'm gonna go John this one. Although 
I, I can see Connor putting up a nice fight. I think this game will be within. I think it, I think it'll be within one hundred fifty points. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm speaking uh, I'm foolish, but I think John's team's really hanging stride after that loss to Tita. He's been on a roll. A lot of his players are getting healthy. A lot of his guys who, you know, were healthy are really starting to hit their groove. I think this is gonna be a nice one for John. Uh, John, I'll go with you. What do you think? Yeah, for this matchup, um, again, I, I always, no matter what league I'm in with Connor, again, one of the best managers I know. So he's going to throw everything at me, like what he's done in, in, in past matchups. I obviously have to roll with myself. Um, you know, again, you said, like, after that Tita matchup, um, something woke up with, with my team. Um, and I think the big thing for me, too, at this point in the season, I just got to get, honestly, um, the biggest part of my team that's missing is Garrett Cole. I think once I get him back and, and, and one of Evaldi, Kelly, or Scherzer, solidifying one or two more arms, then that eliminates the need for a guy like Mikolas. Um, and it just gives me a little more flexibility with, with my bolt, with my um, my rotation. Um, that's what I'm kind of looking forward to throughout this run. I just had a really tough stretch where I had to go against Jab and then hand back to back. Um, and, you know, I think at this point of the season, I just want my, my bats to continue to wake up. Um, some guys I'm also looking to step up a little bit more is, is Olsen to keep rolling. Um, Arenado, who's, who's had a really, really bad year in Lindor. Um, because I, I expect the usual out of Betts, Judge, Otani, the usual. Um, but guys like Arenado, Lindor, um, especially those two are the ones that I really need to also wake up if, um, when I'm in these tight matchups toward the end of the year and maybe in the playoffs. And Connor. I like how both of you were curt about, oh, yeah, I, uh, I think Heights going to win. Heights is definitely going to win. Um, I'm thrilled when my team eclipses yeah. 600 points and Height just dropped 860, and not many people batted an eye. So I do think, obviously, these are teams in just two different positions. And while I hope to keep it close, I'm not too optimistic for that. It would certainly be a Rough yard ghost week to uh, be in that position. So uh, congrats on the likely win, John. But I do look forward to um, making you sweat a little bit, hopefully. Definitely interesting indeed. Now we're going to head over to what I think could be, I don't know, I'm very intrigued by this match because I think there's a lot riding on this for one. And this is Oklahoma City 89 against the Rocky Mountain Fives. We talked about it when he, in his loss to Smell, you know, obviously I think Chad was someone who came in with a lot of expectations um, to, to fight for that last playoff spot. We talked about, you know, the shrewd amount, of the not shrewd, the, the amount of just young talent he had acquired, um, his pitching, he really built his rotation, but after, you know, eight weeks, kind of, you know, positioning himself uh, you know, obviously still only a game behind the seven team. There's still a lot of season left to be played. So, you know, a lot can change. But I feel like, especially against a team like Fry, who is one of the best in the six-game win streak, seven and one, sitting, uh, tied for the second-best record in our league, this is a game I feel like can really show a lot about Chad's team. I don't know. I don't necessarily if he needs to win, but if he gets, you know, if this isn't even a game, um, you know, you know he's scoring <laughs> I hit 700 conversations that might need to be had, but I, I think this is an interesting matchup. I will take Bry. Uh, I, I, I think John, you were the one who said that you think Cody has the best pitching uh, has the best rotation. I, I think I like to push back on that. I, I loved Bry's rotation since the beginning. Uh, I know he's dealing with you know, he, you know, I know Christian Javier's is dealing with injuries, but I, I loved. His, te- his his arms. Um, but, yeah, I think, you know, I think I'll go with Bry here, but I think the big thing I'm looking for, can Chad keep this within, you know, a 100-point game, or can he, can he eclipse, you know, you know the 600, yeah. get, get to the mid-600s, because I think that'll be very telling for, you know, how, you know, you know, the summer really shapes out with how he wants to manage his team. John, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Um, I think for this matchup, um, I am going to take Bry. Um, Bry's been on a roll. Um, 
I I remember someone said this on an earlier podcast, and I I'm glad I'm I'm gonna bring it up again. You know, obviously mm-hmm. talking about the, the the stream limit controversy of the off season, and obviously Bry was the most notorious for that. But in a way, it really really helped because it really allowed Bry to beef up the team and um, buy a little bit more um, be, because of not having some of those stream starts um, here or, or some of those uh, streaming of, of players. Um, and I really just think his team's in a really, really good spot. You talk about his arms. I feel like him and Cody, um, in, in, in some way, you know, they're very comparable for the rotations. Um, and I think if you manage it correctly, too, and I've been kind of trying to do this, too, if, if, if you keep, like, three or four of the relievers throughout the week, so that way you can limit that, that 10, uh, the, the, the 10 number limit, um, it definitely helps because – that can help you beef up a bunch of bats for a day when there's only like three MLB games on and stuff like that. I think Bry's done a really, really good job of that. Um, and obviously all the bats are really waking up for him as well. For Chad, I really want to see if he's going to buy a couple more bats. I mean, he lost Jung Hu Lee. I think, I think he's out for the season. Uh, I know Lankford wasn't playing well and he also got hurt. Um, but he's also got some, some decent bats to ready. Jordan Westberg is one of the best bats in, in baseball this year. So we got guys like Swanson, Morrell, um, and then obviously his pitching is there, his pitch, or as close to there as, as he's been since he's joined the league. Um, so I really am curious to see if, if you know, if he's really trying to compete for those last couple wild card spots. Got to beef up the bats a little bit because, um, like we said, that that inverse is there. The pitching is certainly there. Um, he's got guys. I mean, Yamamoto is a guy who could drop forty on a given day. Um, so we're we'll interested to see if he beefs up the bats and. Uh, I will take Bry for this one, though. Yeah, I think Bry's got this. I, the, the barometer for me is going to be 650 points or so. Um, if the Oklahoma City Baseball Club scores under 300 aim points again or goes under 650 in total, I do think there might there could be some more sell-offs coming, but I'll be very curious if this matchup is still close Thursday. If Chad does buy a bat or something else happens there. So uh, I do think this is a telling matchup, but Bry's going to win it. Yeah, I think that's the sentiment shared about it. This is be something interesting to see how Chad really stacks up against the top half of the league. Um, We're going to bounce over to the next matchup. I'll, I'll go over my matchup where I'm taking on the Rochester Red Wings. Obviously, heartbreaking loss for, I guess, both of us. Uh, you know, Dave, you know, his his loss was so heartbreaking, it didn't even process until uh, 30 minutes after the fact we talked about it. And then myself, obviously, scoring over 800 points and losing is tough. Um, you know, I think this is a good, nice bounce-back week for me. Um, I feel like my team has been doing well. We'll see how they perform without Ronald Acuna, uh, you know, for the rest of the season. but. I like my chances against Dave. Um, obviously, I mentioned this. I actually mentioned this to you know Paul when I was you know discussing about hosting this week or being on the pod. Uh, I won't be around you know for the whole week. I'm going on vacation, so that may may limit my you know you know just kind of regular checking. You know, I'll still be checking every day, make sure stuff is locked in. But obviously, in terms of like you know a player getting last minute removed from a lineup or someone not being available, I might not be as on keen with that. But I think. In a matchup like this, it won't make as much of a difference, in my opinion. But, yeah, I'm going to take myself over Dave, get a nice bounce-back win. And, yeah, that, that's my thoughts. Uh, Connor, what are you thinking? Yeah, I think that the Beach Dogs are going to win this. Um, with Dave, has has some shrewd matchups, but at the end of the day, I think he's has the worst record in the league right now. At, or tied with Bismarck for 1-7, and seven. yeah. So I do think that these are, again, just different classes, teams, at least for for the active roster. So I do, for Chad, it's 650 points. If Dave gets 550, I think there's certainly something to be had there. But Hen's going to win this pretty clearly and hope uh, you get to enjoy your vacation. Thank you, Connor. Appreciate that. And John? Yeah, I mean, I'll be short and sweet. Two teams obviously doing different things right now. I do like what Dave is doing. He's done a good job refining that pitching rotation. He's got some dogs like Riley Green, Correa. Um, 
uh, uh, one other player that I was also stepped up for him. I really like what Abraham Toro has been doing of the A's. Like a guy to get eventually get traded to a better team as well. Um, Connor Joe also has had a pretty good year as well. But yeah, I'm gonna roll with Hen. I mean, I feel like Hen uh, after this past week against me, the team's gonna be extra fired up and riled up after what happened. So uh, Beach Dogs. Yeah, they the the team better not be taking a vacation while I'm on vacation. I'll say that. <laughs> but um. No, yeah, we got a couple more matchups to go before we uh, sign things out. Uh, looking over toward the Rocket City Trash Pandas against the El Paso Chihuahuas. Um, two teams, both at three and five, I think. Well, actually, it was two and six and three and five, excuse me. Both teams with similar records, but I don't think many people expected it going into the season. Uh, we've talked about Homco, where we thought you know, the team would be a lot maybe be a bit better and then smells really you know picking up a nice little two-game win streak to get himself in the middle of the pack really um i think this is the week homco reestablishes himself obviously we saw him trade off jeremy pena for jp crawford but i i just think you know in terms of the talents on the roster i think i like uh you know homco seem a little bit more it is interesting to note. I don't know if Homkos fully says his his lineup. He only has six starts right now. I assume that's probably because he hasn't said it yet. But we'll be getting Sean Murphy back, which is going to be huge for his, you know, his catcher spot because uh, Lewis Cap and Capusano really, you know, hasn't really done a whole lot for him. I guess he's held down the fort, but getting a guy who's you know a consensus top three catcher, you know, back in the lineup for a, a Braves team that you know even without. Ron Acuna still will be a very good team. I think will only help him. Uh, I think this is where he kind of uh, I think this is where he gets back in the win column. And maybe you know, smells smells uh, win streak gets stopped here. Yeah, for this one, um, you know, everything you brought up, Penn, it, it's very logical, and I feel like you know Hamko is due for a big win. Um, you know, also guys like like Glaber has been starting to play a little bit better. Um, in terms of his offense, uh, KB Ohm slowing down just a tad, but still has had a fantastic season. And, and uh, you know, the bats have been there. And, you know, you know, he's got guys like Sonny Gray, who's had a pretty good season as well. Brian Wu. I don't know. My gut's telling me smell um, just the way he's been playing. And I feel like you know, he won the last, where was it, two weeks. Maybe he'll buy a tad and, and get another bat here and there. He's got some guys who truly have been, been tearing the cover off the ball lately. Uh, Brenton Doyle, you know, again, great waiver wire pickup. Um, Nolan Gorman had a 22 point performance last week, um, and just you know the way Smell again, one of, one of the best owners in the league, manages his team. Um, my gut's telling me Smell for some reason, so I, I guess if you consider an upset, still I will go with Smell. And Connor, I'm going to go with Smell for a more concrete reason: the arms. Um, I think. There was a week earlier where Homko missed the start minimum, and just given the injuries the trash pandas have had, I'm not sure if hitting like 10 or 11 is a guarantee. Mel has been very adept at getting good waiver arms and making the most out of them. So I think it's quite possible that um, Mel just out manages or out acquires um, Homko here, one in. One of the GMs has clearly said they're buying. The other has said they're selling. So I do think this is going to be a close one within 30 points, but I'm leaning smell here as well. So we got a, a smelly mullet. Uh, you know, if it if he wins, would it even be considered upset? That could be a conversation we have. I don't know. But um, will be. I think it will be, you know, a very under-the-radar matchup. Uh, you know, I think, like you said, I think it would be a very close game within 50 points of degree. And I think... We have one more matchup. It is the Richmond Flying Squirrels against the Bismarck Larks. John, I'm going to send it over to you. What do you think? So this one, another one I've been kind of debating for a little bit. Um, I think, you know, 300 points is, is not going to cut it. I don't care who you're playing against. And that's what Bracton did this week. Um, I think I'm going to lean Scott just for, uh, for this week. I know Bracton only has the one win. 
Um, I feel like this could be a no, like like this could be a potential, you know, get back game, get it, that second win in the column. For me, it's just the pitching. The pitching just hasn't been there outside of Christian Scott, who again, absolute dog. Weather's been pitching well is uh, too, um, but. You know, Bracton, I think, only had like eight starts last week. Um, I'm I'm not sure if that's just because he was playing against Jab and he was down by like 400 points and just kind of punted the week. Um, but I'm going to pick Scott j- just because he's still got, uh, you know, Bryce Harper for now. Maybe he moves him, then gets a haul. Um, Bryce is starting, and I love C.J. Abrams. And even though, you know, Volpe has been playing out of his mind, I feel like LA slowed down just a little bit. You know, he didn't have a great week last week. Um, since you know, after May 16th, we had 34 points. A lot of negatives. You know, a lot of under five point performances. Um, unless he really wakes up, um, I, I still think Scott's going to win this one. And Connor. So we're eight weeks into the season, and the Squirrels have outscored the Bismarck Larks by 800 points. So Scott is averaging about 100 more points a matchup each week. I don't think that's going to be any different here. I think Scott is just the teams at a different level and going into the season, I think we had them as a potential playoff contender and four and five would certainly be in that given the current state of the league. So I do think that Scott is going to pull ahead with this, but I do think the Larks are going to have a couple um, big performances. Yeah, I would agree as well. Yeah, I mean, I think Scott will be bracked in. Uh, like you said, John, 300 points, like 376 points is pretty, is unacceptable. I mean, multiple teams, but either their arms or their bats outscored that individually. Um, and I know Bracton is not trying to compete, but I, you know, obviously, I, you know, there is a certain level he has to hit, and I don't, and I like Scott Seymour. I was also looking at Braxton starts. I don't think he's going to hit the max start limit. Um, could also just be like a situation where Fantrax hasn't named some, like, hasn't listed someone as a probable starter, and they'll eventually be the starter. But I, I was kind of skimming through, and I think he, he's under the, I think he has the minimum, but he's not at the max yet, so. <laughs> Definitely something to, to look out for uh, indeed, but that will do it for week eight of the Based on Balls podcast. Crazy thing about we're already two months into the season. Um, You know, I know we've been talking about playoff picture, but just giving a little bit of a standings roundup after eight weeks. Cody lean the way at eight and oh. John Height and Bry are tied for second at seven and one. Jab is in fourth at six and two. Myself. Paul and Tita are tied at four and four. And then at three and five, you have Scott, Smell, Chad, Connor, uh, Comco, two and six. And at the bottom at one and seven is Dave and Bracton. So, you know, obviously we still have the whole summer to go through, but, you know, we're starting to kind of, you're starting to get a little bit of, you know, who's going to be at the top, who's fighting for a middle playoff spot, who might be on the outside looking in, who might sneak in on the inside, and who's at the bottom. Um, has anything really surprised you two in terms of, you know, how well teams have been playing or how, you know, underperforming teams have been two months or two months into the season? Yeah, I think for me, I've been, I'm looking at the standings now. This is really the first time in a couple of weeks I've kind of dissected it. Um, starting in the Grady Sizemore division, um, Cody and Jab, not a surprise. You knew that they were going to be one and two in that division. Um, I'm expecting, you know, Paul had that hot streak, and if not for this week, he'd be above 500. I think Paul's team is going to kind of – he's not a 500 team. I, I do think he's, his team is better than that. Um, so I think he's going to kind of solidify himself in that number three spot, I think, throughout the next couple of weeks. Um, I know Keita's going to be fighting with him for that spot as well. Uh, but just the, kind of the trajectories of those teams right now, I'd probably lean a little more towards Paul even though Tita obviously could change on a dime with the way he's, he's able to accumulate all these good assets. Um, and then obviously Scott Connor, um, still well in the mix, you know, only a, a game behind. Looks like Tita and Paul at four and four. So, you know, a hot stretch for them could also get them going. Um, in my division, or, or sorry, me and Hen's division, um, definitely, you know, me, Brian, Hen, um, 
probably you know going to be the, probably the top three for 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 the majority of the year. Um, me and Bry in the seven and one spot. Um, I'm not going to lie. Before the season, I I really thought that'd be where Hen was. Um, but I know Hen's kind of had some bad luck. You know, he's played me twice. Um, I think he lost to Bry as well. And I, you know, he's not a four and four team. He he should be above five hundred. He's going to be a top, you know, f- you know, four team in the league um, by the by by the end of the regular season. Um, but again, really interesting to see what Smell and um, and Chad are going to do, especially Chad, because um, he's he's also not a three and five team. I feel like he's better than his record. Same with Pomco at two and six, um, and Dave obviously has, has put up some big numbers as well against some teams. And you know, he's the one. I think he beat Cody last year, and you know, has a chance to really beat anyone in a given week. So definitely. You know, that's kind of what I've been looking at throughout all these teams. And, and for me, I'm just happy that I'm leading the, the league in points scored, which kind of shows me that my, my team is getting back to what it was last year. And uh, excited to play uh, Cody, whatever that is. I know it was later in the season, but excited to go up against the hot rods again like, like I did last year. And, Connor, what have, you see, what have you been seeing? Yeah, I think the – Two main winners I'd want to point out or the teams that are doing much better than I thought they would be are Paul and Bry. Um, last year, I think Bry was like the five seed and Paul was the seven and preseason predictions had them relatively similar. Bry has clearly shown that he is a in the top tier. Uh, 6,091 points through eight weeks, that beats Cody. So I think the vibes have done terrific, and then Paul's obviously gone on a hot stretch. Um, the Beach Dogs have maybe underperformed a little bit at four and four, but I'm not too worried there. I think the Trash Pandas are kind of the real surprise for some low performances. Four thousand six hundred points. I've scored higher. Scott scored higher. So I'm curious how. Right now, I think Tita's in line for the seventh seed, and I'm curious what other challengers could be there. But for the most part, I think, yeah, this has just entirely shown the parity of the league, which is great. You know, I definitely think uh, the parity of the league has been a lot better this year. Um, I think the parity of the league has been a lot better this year, and that it's something that, you know, we've talked about. Obviously, I said before, a lot of these teams, you know, there was a lot of roster turnover or a lot of own last year. And so, you know, I feel like now teams are starting to, you know, the owners are starting to get their teams in their vision. Uh, we kept everyone but one person from last year, and Jabs obviously made a great addition this year. Um, in terms of the teams that have surprised me, in terms of positively, uh, Smell of 3 and 5 has been really shocking. Uh, this was a team I think was the consensus, you know, worst or second worst team. And, you know, right now he's a game behind the fifth seed. You know, obviously, you know, still a lot of time left being played, but I think that's one thing to keep look at. And I think we've seen him kind of shift his direction, but li- be a little bit more of a buyer. And I think, you know, depending on how things shake out, maybe he's still in this position, you know, a couple of months from now. Um, That's been the real shocker in terms of teams playing up to, comp- up to their competition. Um, you, know, you know, disappointing, I will agree. I think my team has disappointed in terms of record. I mean, I'm still, I think, fourth in points four, but, you know, I had to play John twice, including last week. I had to play Brock. Those are teams I should be, you know, being on par with, but, you know, it is the Madden situation. Also, you know, teams been injured, just lost, you know, I obviously lost Strider very early in the season, just lost Acuna, but I think my team is going to be firmly in a playoff spot still. You know, maybe I won't be in the top, you know, three that I would have, you know, maybe expected, but I think I've been saying as long as you're in the playoffs, really anything could happen. Um, and I think also, you know, Homko's disappointed, like you guys said as well. Um, you know, I thought he'd be, you know, you know, kind of more in that, you know, eight to, you know, eight to nine C record right now. He's in 12, uh, are selling right now. So kind of shocking to imagine, but that'll do it for the base on balls podcast week eight of the base on balls podcast. Already two months in crazy to think about, but for Connor and John Hunt, I have been Hen. We'll be back next week. Take care, stay safe, and see you next week.
Connor, you're good to end it. No, I'm, I'm trying to end it, and it's telling me you need the man server permission to have an access role in recordings. What the? Oh my God. Some fucking hoopla. Like, did it stop recording? No, it hasn't. Like, it, uh, it's literally not letting me press the buttons <laughs> to do it. Hmm. Wow. You know what? We should. What if we don't stop the recording? It's just a 16 hour long podcast and see how long it takes for people to realize it's over. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. Uh, oh. One episode. It was electric. Oh, my God. Why is that stop it? No, it's so to use these voice things, you need like man have an access role to manage recordings. And I don't, my sometimes they've given like managed server stuff, other times they have not. Hmm. Do we like leave? Does it stop automatically? I'm back. I don't know. Ugh. What time? Why isn't it? Well, I I don't know. I don't know if it's gonna stop or not. You're all at fall. All right. Oh, God, it's one thirty. What an episode. God. Yeah. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop off because I got a long day tomorrow. No, so am I. Yeah. But... All right. We'll see. All right. See ya.